What kind of genius does it take to create a country that's divided by another country? What was this logic? Because the population mix was such, these are the Muslim majority areas. Even though they were separated by India, it was decided that there will be East Pakistan and West Pakistan. Pakistani textbooks, Operation Gibraltar is not mentioned. You compare what Pakistani kids are saying and what Indian kids are saying. 180 degrees apart. Saying they were a person. He was Pakistani. Islam or Pakistan? Hey, Islam. Islam comes first, Pakistan baad mein aayega. The same question was put to Indians. Religion or India? Hey, of course India. The difference in the mindset. Have you seen that meme of those kids going, I love Pakistan. I can sacrifice my life for Pakistan. A small incident from my life. I was in Dubai. I met a guy, clearly Pashtun. I said, "Kaise ho, bhai? Ab Pakistani ho?" He's like, "Ha, bhai." Then we vibed a little bit. He's like, "Ab India mein kahan se ho?" I said, "Mumbai." And I said, "Ab Pakistan mein kahan se ho?" And he said, "Kashmir." And then I just shut up. <laughs> then uh, 1988, Zia died in the plane crash. You mean like in inverted comma? Yes. Nobody knows how he died. Interesting. We always wrestling WWE. That's what it seems like. So always things are happening. Someone's against the other. Some drama is happening. Wrong Long decision after the other. Now you know why I write on Pakistan. Yeah. <laughs> so the first part of this conversation with Tilak Devishar was very well received, even from Pakistan. We have viewers from Pakistan. We spoke about Pakistani history pre 1947. This is an attempt to learn Pakistani history post 1947 up till the point of the Kargil War. It's such a complex history. It's so layered that we need a sequel to this episode as well. but it's an epic history of the last 75 years or so from the pakistani side a lot of indians don't know about what happened in pakistan the details of it from the last 75 years so if there's one person in india who's capable of dishing out these kind of details in detail it's tilak sir enjoy this extremely detailed special on pakistani history and almost modern pakistan politics lots of love if you're a viewer from pakistan please tell me what you thought of these episodes please tell me who else you'd like to see on the show i'm very open to bringing pakistani guests on the show as well very open to your suggestions but for now enjoy this episode another epic history oriented pakistan oriented episode with tilak sir in the house how are you sir good good uh i feel kind of embarrassed being this casual with you when it comes to your level of knowledge but uh i'm just being myself i hope you don't mind this not at all on the other hand your 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 style you say casual it's actually lot more than casual <laughs> you're able to you know pose some very fundamental questions okay so that's good Uh, I've just learned very early on in life that it's important to ask even the stupid questions because it's actually the stupid questions where you really get to the basics. So and many times people are not able to answer the stupid questions. Many people are not able to answer the stupid questions. Yeah. Why do you say that? Because they're not they they take intellectual questions for granted. They expect those, but stupid questions just bores them. Mm. So don't mind some more stupid questions on this episode. Please go right ahead. Okay, this one is a sequel to what we did the last time. I assume that the contents of this particular episode will be a part of the last one, but we just went so in depth with what I would like to believe is uh, pre-independence Pakistan history that we couldn't cover post-independence Pakistan history. So this is the story of Pakistan from the Indian perspective, but by someone who's dedicated his whole life to studying about Pakistan. and his whole life to writing about pakistan from an objective perspective uh our pakistani brothers and sisters actually accept your narratives it's not frowned upon your narratives are celebrated so let's hear the audio version of that uh, on the ranveer show sir uh welcome back thank you so much ranveer thank you let's begin by talking about jinnah's life post independence is that a right place to begin yeah he didn't live very long you know after after again pakistan was created it didn't become independent because there was no pakistan before hand so he was actually suffering from consumption you know and one doctor in uh, bombay had diagnosed him and the british came to know tb right yeah so the this is it is suspected that one of the reasons why the british advanced um uh, leaving india it was earlier supposed to be 1948 but they advanced it to august 47 because they didn't think jinnah would survive that long and they knew it 
and this doctor hadn't told anybody he you know kept to his professional duties so and jina was he had a very unfortunate death he was uh, recuperating in ziarat which is a place in balochistan good climate to uh, you know so uh, people used to go and meet him over there and uh, on one occasion when he met lagat ali who was a prime minister and lagat ali came out he says now he realizes his mistake and because jina told him that creating pakistan was one of the biggest mistakes in my life and this is documented now he realizes his mistake and when he was coming back from ziarat uh, to karachi uh, there was nobody to receive him at karachi airport and there was a broken down ambulance which broke down and that broke down halfway to the uh, road from the airport to the governor general's residence and his adc took 2 hours to find another ambulance and for 2 hours jina was in this hot and humid ambulance which really ruined his health even further he was already suffering it really and he passed away soon thereafter what <laughs> yes and then he was a shia but his public funeral was as a sunni and he was given a shia burial burial uh, shia rites privately he couldn't even find in death his uh, the right kind of why do you think he felt like it was a mistake creating pakistan he didn't expect the kind of violence and killing that took place again he totally misjudged it you mean you, hindu muslim violence yeah you see when uh, you he created a state on the basis of hindus and muslims how did he expect that hindus he wanted the hindus and sikhs to stay on in pakistan as a guarantee against the safety of muslims in india but once you have a partition on the basis of communal division there was no way that the hindus and sikhs were going to stay on and the unfortunate part of partition was that the ratcliffe award was not announced before 15th of august on 15th of august people in lahore lahore was a hindu majority town people did not know whether lahore would be in india or in pakistan i think it was announced the 17th or 18th it is then they realized we are on the wrong side of the border and then they started moving out then the mass killings took place killings had started in march in rawalpindi especially i know there was build up of uh, all this thing but after the ratcliffe award division and especially in the case of lahore all hell broke loose i think jira realized he didn't expect uh, that this would happen so that's why he called a moth eaten pakistan that if the, all of the hindus are going to leave and sikhs are going to leave what remains of pakistan what happened to like the property owned by the sikhs and the hindus what happened to it became evacuee property it was kabza karod by the army no 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 by uh, by punjabis in oh. in in like you know like in the case of india this became evacuee property so when people from pakistan came to india or when people from india went to pakistan they registered themselves they said this was my property this is the proof to the extent they could provide and a similar property was allotted to them from the evacuee property of people who had left oh okay like a trade yeah okay so people uh, who came to uh, pakistan they got properties in um, uh, in punjab and other places the interesting thing about the muslims who came from india that about 1 million about 18% or so settled in karachi and hyderabad the urban areas from all over india and they subsequently because they were in such large numbers in an urban environment they subsequently started being called a were called muhajirs and they set up an ethnic identity of their own they didn't learn sindhi initially they were the uh, uh, ruling uh, class you know like uh, jina and lagat ali they were also came from india so they did very well when bhutto came he started promoting the sindhis then the sense of alienation which their forefathers had felt in british india you know when i talked about in the last episode the alienation among the muslim elite of losing power and patronage they started feeling the same and so they started calling themselves muhajirs and 1986 they started the muhajir qaumi movement 86 uh, 1986 okay 40 okay. years after partition let me just kind of do a small recap of what i've understood from your, what you said so there were muslims from all over india yeah. be it even kerala maybe be it uh, bengal be it uh, delhi yeah. lucknow who were the muslim elite they decided okay let's be a part of pakistan they go there they go to these two big no, cities bulk of them settled in punjab the punjabi especially settled in punjab okay but 
1 million, about 18% of the total refugees who came, settled in the urban areas of Karachi and Hyderabad. And they were from all over India? They were all from all over India. Okay. And they became a separate ethnic group? Yeah. Because they didn't, they were in such large numbers that they didn't have to adopt to the local uh, Sindhi language or Sindhi customs. Okay. Cool. Um, and they were Urdu speaking. Urdu became the national language. Karachi became the capital. So they felt a sense of empowerment. And they were educated. They were educated. And they believed that Pakistan had been created by them. They had created Pakistan. Okay. Once Bhutto came and the Sindhis started getting their due, they got the sense of alienation. Ki, though we created Pakistan, look at the way we are being treated. Before I let you expand on Bhutto, I'm going to ask you about uh, these people today. Is it like, do they exist as a separate ethnic class? Even today, what, what what word did you use? Yeah, Mohajir. Mohajir. Yeah, Mohajir so, is like you know, a person who does hijrat, you know, who flees like the prophet, went from one place to, from Makkah to Medina because it's called the hijrat. Okay. So they ca- call themselves Mohajirs. So from India they came to. Are they still like the rich? So they still call uh, uh, Mohajirs. They still call themselves Mohajirs. Others refer to them as Mohajir. Okay. They were very strong till about the nineteen nineties. Because of one leader, Altaf Hussain, who was a firebrand, charismatic kind of a person. So then he fell foul of the army. Okay. He sought refuge in London. And today, the Mohajir Qaumi movement has broken up into various parties. But the Mohajir element, and they are a dominant element, that whoever side they vote for, you know. Okay. So the PPP has managed to get some ground back in. The PTI did well. Earlier, when uh, after 47, the Jamaat Islami and the Jamaat Ulama Pakistan, these were the two religious parties, they used to win the elections there. Then, when the MQM, Mahajal Qaumi movement, came into its own, they won all the elections from about 86 onwards. You'll have to give context on all this. <laughs> so, so, I'm going to take you back to around 1950, back to the timeline, and we can move very gradually, gently. And so, till context. Bhutto came, till the, after the 71 war, the Mahajis were in their own elements. Okay. They were the ruling class. In Pakistan, Urdu was the language. Karachi was their capital. They were in the civil services. They got a lot of land in Sindh, which had been left by Hindus. But once the Sindhis started coming into their own, when uh, Bhutto promoted the Sindhis, when the capital got shifted to Islamabad, they started feeling edged out of power and patronage. Can you give some context on Bhutto? He was a Sindhi. Okay. And uh, his father was a great landlord, one of the richest landlords in the Sindh. And he was there. In fact, in the case of Bhutto, he claimed property in Bombay, even though he was, he had moved to uh, Karachi. Okay. There also he claimed property and he claimed property. And finally, after a long time, it was settled and his property was uh, treated as evacuee property. Okay. So then he became uh, prime minister, you know, he left or Yub Khan became prime minister and then he started promoting uh, the Sindhis. In my second book, I have a fascinating chapter on Bhutto, two chapters on Bhutto, in fact. What was happening between 1950 and 1971? Why did this, what led up to the 71 war? Okay, so that's a different, uh, you know, in uh, because East Pakistan was treated very unfairly. First was a language. They were told that their language was not Islamic enough and therefore Urdu had to be the national language. As I mentioned earlier, for Bengalis, the language is a far more salient point of their identity than religion. So they were up in arms. Then the exploitation, the Punjabi exploitation, they were not, jute was a major export, a lot of earnings, but money was not invested there. So gradually, karte karte till Mojiva Rahman came forward and put forward his own program. And in the 1970 elections, he won an over 160 seats um, one of 164, something like that. And logically, he should have been Prime Minister of Pakistan. Bhutto had won the majority of seats in West Pakistan. And he was not willing, and neither was the army willing, to Muj- let Mujibur Rahman be Prime Minister of Pakistan. So Bhutto wow. made this famous t- comment when he was asked, Ki udar tum idar hum. <laughs> you know, meaning that you be there and I'll be here. So he didn't allow the National Assembly session to be held in Dhaka. And that's when then Mujibur Rahman gradually moved towards declaring uh, there was a big crackdown in March 1970, leading to the creation of Mukti Baini. Three million people were butchered by the Pakistan army. What kind of genius does it take 
to create a country that's divided by another country like that's split up by a massive country in the middle yeah what was this logic like why was this even a thing i don't buy that it was just religion there's got to be some geopolitical angle here um maybe the british you i think in the last podcast you said that they wanted to keep uh pakistan as a powerful entity which is why they combined balochistan etc but at the same time don't make them too powerful that's why keep a part of their country on the other side of no, india no because the population mix was such that this was the majority population uh, muslim population area you're talking about bangladesh bangladesh or east pakistan then and therefore the two separate parts which were the muslim majority this is what jinnah had said these are the muslim majority areas mm so even though they were separated by uh you know india uh, they decided that there will be east pakistan and west pakistan man but i would look at it as like another sort of sri lanka kind of place you know that's that's the logical thing to do on the british behalf on the behalf of the leadership at the time they should have just like made it a separate country back then there has to be some underlying logic as to why but then again that would mean that you're accepting another nationality You see, as I said, Jina just looked at Hindus and Muslims. Okay. There is okay. one entity, so there is majority, there is here majority, here, so they become one. If you accept, then the Pashtuns would say, "We want to separate," as ah. as uh, Gafar Khan said, That's Pashtuns, the Bengalis, you know. So he couldn't accept this. Okay. Okay. They for this. So the crackdown happened. Mukti Bhaini was formed. They fought against the Pakistan army. Interestingly, in the, under Ayub Khan. there was after the 65 war the army doctrine was defense of the east lies in the west that means if india were to attack east pakistan west pakistan would attack india and make sure that east pakistan remains safe hmm defense of the east lies in the west but once the 71 war began yahya khan dithered from attacking he did attack pakistan on the preemptive strike but did not do it fully as a result east pakistan was left on its own defenseless and niazi one of the uh, same tribe as imran khan they deployed their forces in penny packets all along the border when the indian comes we'll stop them there instead of in the basic element uh, rule in uh, military deployment is you concentrate your force instead of concentrating them around dhaka because without dhaka it'd be very difficult to declare victory So what the Indian Army did was they bypassed these penny pockets. Some they defeated. So they bypassed it and raced towards Dhaka. By the time Niazi realized it, it was too late. He was surrounded and surrendered, and then uh, Bangladesh came into uh, existence. It's bound to happen because yeah. wars are won or lost based on logistics. If your massive chunk of your military equipment, food, logistics are connected to the war zone, you'll probably win the war. But here you're divided by a yeah. massive landmass called Bharat. you're on you're trying to have a war and, on and, that and, you know, side and overflights had been stopped so everything had to come via colombo and uh, you know down the this thing so bound to happen um so i mean we were and we're not getting any intelligence because the bengalis were totally alienated okay yeah i mean this is not surprising at all that this was the outcome and i'm sure people expected this to happen in that period between 1971 and 1947 like they probably would have expected bangladesh to break away anyway I think Mount Batten. Somebody had made this prediction even then. This is not going to survive more than twenty-five years. Okay. But if the West Pakistani elite had, you know, decentralized, better invested in East Pakistan, maybe they could have prolonged it. But okay. that was not the army mentality, now. Okay. In this same phase, is there a Cold War element also in Pakistan? were they truly supplied by america when it comes to equipment in the same way that people believe that india was an economic colony of russia and pakistan was an economic colony of america is that true i i don't think so india was an economic colony we yes arms supplies were coming from russia as pakistan was receiving from uh, uh, from pakistan you see the one critical element in this whole thing was that it was during 1970 that yahya khan acted as a messenger for nixon and kissinger to china kissinger landed in uh, pakistan and then he made a big show of going to mari but actually took a flight and went to beijing and met chavin lai and met mao zedong that was the us opening to china 
and the Americans were always grateful to Pakistan for having facilitated it. And Chao Inlai made this famous statement that we, when he met Yahya Khan, he said, we believe the message you are coming because it is from a president to another president through another president. Nixon, Mao, Yahya Khan. So, you know, uh, Pakistan was in a very good book. The Blood Telegram, which was written by the US Embassy in Dhaka, a consulate in, in Dhaka, they detailed the kind of brutality the Pakistan army was indulging in. It's called the Blood Telegram. The entire mission wrote the telegram. But the Americans just uh, ignored it because they had a larger game, the geopolitics that you're talking about, they had a yeah. larger game of China. So they ignored the killings that were taking place, which Pakistan was doing. Okay. Uh, you know, honestly, I'm actually not finding it easy to travel through this conversation because there's so much that's happened in this time period. When we are talking about pre-independence in Pakistan, it's like a pretty linear yeah. line yeah. about how it got formed. Here, there's geopolitical angles. There's a Cold War angle. There are the wars that took place. And then uh, USS Sixth Fleet moved into the Bay of Bengal as a threat to India during the war. What year was this? 71. 71. During the 71 war, the US Sixth Fleet uh, moved into the uh, Bay of Bengal as a to threaten India that don't uh, mess around with East Pakistan. Okay. And the geopolitical angle here is that Nehru was close to Russians. Nehru was socialist in his mindset. The same with Indira Gandhi. By the time 71 was Indira Gandhi. The Prior Gandhi, to that, yeah. The Gandhi family yeah. probably was viewed as an ally to socialism, which is Russia at that time. Therefore, America took that stance of being our enemy because uh, they yeah, were because, just you know, opposed but, but, to Russia. Yeah. And uh, Pakistan was willing to give bases uh, to uh, the US. If you remember the famous U-2 incident, you know, when the US planes, U-2 planes used to fly over the Soviet Union based out of Peshawar. Oh. And okay. Gary, uh, he was shot down and captured by the Russians, the Soviets at that time. There was no way India would have given any bases. So, in the Cold War scenario, it was the US was Pakistan and Pakistan had joined these various blocs, you know, CETO, CATO, CENTO, Baghdad Pact and things like that. Okay. And India was following a non-aligned policy. Why didn't we side with the US at that point? Uh, that was the policy of the Congress government. We were non-aligned, we were leaders of the non-aligned movement. We didn't want to be part of power blocs. We wanted to keep the power blocs away from the subcontinent. What was the administrative thinking at that point? Like, was there a lack of geopolitical understanding? No, no, no. no. This was, this was, I think, uh, non-alignment was an excellent thing that you keep away from both the blocks. And you focus on your own growth. Yeah. And when you need weapons, you take it from whoever is going to give you. Do you think that was the right move? Yeah, I think so. At that time, at that time, you see, we were not a developed country. We were not even a developing country. We were pretty, you know, food, for example. There was food scarcity, food shortages, all kinds of problems India was facing. So if you got involved in block politics, you know, okay. it would have been... Uh, so I think that was the right, absolutely right. Okay. Right. I have a slightly random question for you. Hmm. Do you remember the 60s? I remember 65. I was okay. going to boarding school at that time. Okay. Like your childhood was in the 60s. Yeah. What was your viewpoint of Pakistan then? Like and they we, told you the stories my father told us about two Pakistani Air Force officers who had been his commanding officers in the Second World War. No, but did you look at Pakistan as a very powerful neighboring country? No. You didn't. Because the modern day Indian kid probably looks at Pakistan as an extremely weakened state. No. When I was a kid in the 90s, I didn't look at it as a weakened state. I knew that, okay, the Kargil war is happening. These guys are a very strong rival. That's not how I view them now after I've got understanding through the show. Yeah. So my question to you is the 60s version of the same. Yeah, so in 65... You know, uh, when the 65 war took place, and my father was very much involved in the war. So then you started realizing that, you know, there is a, this is the enemy, you know, uh, we have just fought a war, our people have died. That's when the awareness of Pakistan started. I still didn't think it was a very strong state. Okay. But, That's... you know, uh, that it, it, it is definitely a thing which we need to be in war too. By the time we came to 71, then you realize that you've broken off half the country. Okay. So it's a totally different perspective. Okay. Now, what was happening with this whole POK situation in that whole phase? Like, why is this POK situation even a thing now? What had happened then? So, in 1965, you see, you have to go back to 1947. 
In 1947, Pakistan had signed a standstill agreement with the Raja of Kashmir. Raja of Kashmir. It had signed a standstill agreement with Kalat also. But it broke that standstill agreement and sent in raiders. You know these Kabyli Lashkars. Like terrorists. Well, you can call them modern day terrorists, but they're the ones who Pakistan sent them to forcibly convince or merge Kashmir uh, with. Uh, Pakistan, like guerrilla soldiers. They were not guerrillas. They were actually out and out, uh, you know, soldiers. Uh, yeah. Okay. I mean, okay. tribal. They were they were not trained army. It's not an army, but Kabyle, you know, and, and Pashtun tribals were in any case armed to the teeth since birth. You know, they were always uh, fighting men. So it goes back to then, forty seven, forty eight, when this Kabyle thing took place. Then in sixty five. So this war lasted forty eight till the truce came in nineteen forty nine. When the UN passed resolutions about plebiscite and things like that, in 1965, Ayub Khan sent in infiltrators called under Operation Gibraltar. I wonder if you've heard of Operation Gibraltar. So he sent up uh, infiltrators that they will go and create trouble in uh, Kashmir, and once again we will be able to pull Kashmir towards. So that didn't happen because the Kashmiris they identified these raiders, they were arrested and put behind bars. This is a soft form of terrorism. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And this has been happening since the fifties. Since forty-seven. Since the forties. Yeah. Great. Go on. And then in seventy-one, to take that argument forward, you had Al Shams and Al Badr in Bangladesh. These were again militia groups who were targeting uh, Bengalis, especially Hindus. Where did they originate from? From they were Bengalis, trained okay. by Pakistan. Got gotcha. you. So again, you know, so the Pakistan has a decades-long history of terrorism. Yeah, I, I mean, again, now I don't know if the modern-day Pakistani has the same narrative, but every he doesn't know because in Pakistani textbooks, Operation Gibraltar is not mentioned. They treat it as sixth of September when India invaded in Lahore. Yeah, they think the war began in sixty-five. Actually, it began much before that. Yeah, very random question. Have you seen that meme of those kids going, "I love Pakistan. I can sacrifice my life for Pakistan." Have you seen this? You've seen it, right? Yeah. There's a kid that comes up and says, "I want to be fighter pilot and destroy India or something like that." Yeah. Is that the mindset right now? That so we are. This we... is what they are taught. This is what the films are made, and a similar one on the Indian children. You know, much more softer. Talking about education, talking about all kinds of things. Indian kids saying the same thing, and you compare what Pakistani kids are saying and what Indian kids are saying. You know, hundred and eighty degrees apart. So again, that's the mindset. Um, every modern day Indian, and again, I know there are Pakistanis watching this, and this is where I think modern day Pakistanis and modern day Indians are uh, not in agreement. Modern day Indians look at Pakistan as a big breeding ground for terrorism. Uh, I don't know if the modern day Pakistani looks at their country in that way because the government, aka the army, keeps denying it. It's not so much again a very interesting. There were a person who interviewed. People in Pakistan and people in India. He asked Pakistanis, "What is more important for you, Islam or Pakistan?" Hey, Islam. Islam comes first. Pakistan baad mein aayega. The same question was put to Indians. What for you is more important, religion or India? They said, "Of course, India. Hmm. Religion will come after the India, then the religion." So you know, this is the change difference in the mindset. That for the Pakistani, he's been taught this. It is religion first and always. So Pakistani is confused. Is he a Muslim first or a Pakistani, or is he a Pakistani first and then he is a Muslim? In the case of India, there is no confusion. We are Indians. Does we may have differences, but we are Indians first. Yeah, hundred um, percent. Does the modern day Pakistani know that parts of the country are breeding grounds for terrorism? Do they I, know this? I, I'm sure. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Now I'll come back to this. Timeline of us. I'm sorry. I know this podcast is a little bit scattered, but there's just too much to convey to the listener. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm sorry. Do you feel we're doing justice no. to the topic? Yeah. Okay. There's it's, it's a just mix. it's yeah. a very dense uh, topic that we're opening up. Yeah. Uh, let's go back to the seventy one war. The outcomes were that Bangladesh will be a separate uh, state. Did it have any effect on POK? Well, there was. I think um, this is Gandhi's. Plan was that you know to shift the forces from uh, East Pakistan towards Kashmir and attempt to finish POK at one at that time. But then 
सिक्योरिटी काउंसिल प्रेशर इवन द सोवियट्स सेट की बस से नो यू क्रिएटेड अ कंट्री एंड ले ऑफ सो दैट वॉज दी आई थिंक दैट वाई डू द सोवियट देखो देखो टू वीटो रेजोल्यूशन इन द सिक्योरिटी काउंसिल अप टू अ पॉइंट you know they'd already vetoed resolutions asking india to stop because they wanted end you know let bangladesh be created before you have a veto in the security council no but why does russia have a say in this in the first place because, because they was defending you in the security council all the other countries were voting against you hmm okay uh so beyond the surface when you go one layer deep what was russia's intention for saying don't uh, do this whole pok thing because they couldn't continue to defend you in the security council okay okay all right see the, it is a very unusual circumstance of east pakistan when there were 10 million refugees in india because of the arm pakistan army crackdown we had 10 million refugees so that was a peculiar situation which allowed india to interfere that how are you going to deal with these people and the kind of butchery that you are doing in pok there was no such provocation okay um is it fair to say that it would piss off america a lot because america at was at that time yes at that time because america was siding with pakistan at that time yeah. and maybe and they didn't want the decimation of the pakistan army because it was an asset for them in a potential actual hot war with russia yeah that's the angle here. yeah and they felt they, they you know pakistan had uses so again this whole india pakistan rivalry that's been happening since 1947 is heavily influenced by the geopolitical scenario between 1947 and 2023 let me put it frame it differently sure. the rivalry was already there okay geopolitics sort of enhanced the the outer sort of uh, thing without the rivalry without the kind of um, uh, lack of identity of pakistan or trying to be parity with india if this was not there the geopolitical rivalry would not have been there would not have the kind of impact okay okay uh before we move forward a small incident from my life i was in dubai uh we had a very uh nice touristy location there and uh, i met a guy he was clearly pashtun uh so i said kaise ho bhai ab pakistani ho and he's like ha bhai ab uh, indian ho kya and then we vibed a little bit and then he's like ab india mein kahan se ho so i said mumbai and then i said ab pakistan mein kahan se ho and he said kashmir and then i just shut up <laughs> cuz how do you react to that <laughs> like how do you react to it honestly it's fine he's from a part of his country which is represented as a part of my country in the textbooks that i read it is, growing up log- uh, legally it is legally it is yeah but he says that he's pakistani because at that time from 47 onwards it was if you look at the pakistan constitution gilgit baltistan is not mentioned at all okay till today it is not a part of pakistan okay gilgit baltistan is uh, pok no no where is there it there is one is pakistan occupied kashmir which is muzaffarabad you know uh, the person adjoining Uh, you know on the west of uh, kashmir muzaffarabad srinagar then you have in the north the larger area which is gilgit and baltistan okay. skardu you know that area does not figure as part of pakistan constitution even today it has no uske koi shanakht nahi hai and it's not a province of pakistan it's been left in limbo uh, what's happening there because you see this <laughs> okay this is going to take some time to no go for it this was part of the territory of the maharaja so in uh, october 22nd the uh, raiders uh, attacked kashmir by 26th it was clear that the raiders had been repulsed because the indian army uh, landed and they were started repulsing the raiders they realized that then there, there was an organization called the gilgit scouts led by one major brown he arrested the governor of the maharaja uh, gansara singh and there was a lot of confusion whether it was a local authority what happened but ultimately pakistan took control of that area now how does pakistan justify taking control of that area so in 1949 there was this karachi agreement where the um, uh, muslim conference the azad so called azad jammu and kashmir and pakistan they got together and they said this area is handed over to pakistan nobody from gilgit baltistan was present 
And the person of the um, uh, Muslim conference has later on wrote a book to say he had not signed any agreement. So by a subterfuge, Pakistan managed to get hold of that area. Now, when the UN uh, Security Council resolutions were passed, they said that no one side will unilaterally change the status quo of this area. So, which means that Pakistan could not absorb this place as its province. It has tried several times in the past. Many committees have been set up. The Chinese are telling them, hey, make this part of your because we are investing in you know, China, Pakistan, economic corridor goes to that area. Make this part of it, make it a province. Give it a legal status. They've examined it from all sides and they have not been able to do it because if they do it, they break the UN Security Council resolutions, which is the only thing that Pakistan has giving it a local standi in the Kashmir issue. Okay. So it has uh, no status. Okay. <sighs> Again, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to just simplify this for the end consumer and we're just adding more density, which is fantastic. Uh, you tell me how I should take like the podcast ahead at this point, because we're not talking about linear timelines here. There's like five or six issues yeah. which we're moving forward through. In so, parallel. you know, in uh, what has happened in, uh, let's stick with POK. And sure. There is now... A lot of alienation in POK and uh, GB, Gilgit Baltistan, because this area has been kept neglected and deprived for the sake of, they've been treated as a base camp for Kashmir. That is, Kashmir ki, we have to grab Kashmir. Until that time, you're a base camp, therefore, we can't do development over here. As now, the and, breeding terrorists, the? The camp, training camps are there. Yeah. Okay. And whenever they have to cross over into India, they come through this area. Okay. When they see what is happening in JNK, they see the schools, they see the colleges, they see the roads, they see the universities, they see health facilities, they see tourism, they see sports. And they say, why are we suffering for so long? So now there is a movement in Gilgit Baltistan and in uh, POK saying that we, you know, we don't want Pakistan, we'd rather be part of India. Okay. So this is a major thing that is happening. This is not reported by Pakistani media. No, they will not. But, you know, because thanks to social media and uh, YouTube and on Twitter and things like that, you, you find a lot, uh, lot of clips, a lot of people shouting slogans against the Pakistan army in POK and in Gilgit, Baltistan. They're also unhappy because of the Chinese presence. Okay. You know, in, in, the, in the area, in the pockets where the China-Pakistan economic corridor is going through. Why are they unhappy with it? With the Chinese. Yeah. Because of the Chinese domineering uh, influence. Because, see, it's when Chinese come to build something, they come with their own labor. The Chinese people are settling down in Pakistan. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, settling down, at least these people get no jobs. They get no benefits. Likewise, in Gwadar, the Baloch are upset because everything is being monopolized either by the Chinese or by Punjabis. Baloch are becoming a minority in their own land. Okay. Um, what's happening in West Pakistan, now Pakistan, post-71 war? So Bhutto took over. Okay. You know, he came back from New York where he had gone to in the UN uh, General uh, Assembly. He came back, took over as chief marshal law administrator and then he carried on. Then the 77 elections took place. He rigged them badly. Zia threw him out, staged a coup and then Zia's marshal law of 9, 11 years or something like that. Give some context on Zia. So Zia was way down the list of picking order of the senior most left-wing generals. And Bhutto picked him up because he thought he'd be a pliant. Zia used to be very obsequious. Oh, oh that's too big a word. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he was very servile. He was okay. very, you know, whenever Bhutto would visit him, he would... Submissive. Very submissive, you know, to, uh, telling Bhutto all kinds of things and all that. And there were some fascinating stories which I've mentioned in my book. Bhutto used to refer to Zia as my monkey general. He used to call him Bandar. Oh, Bandar idara in front of foreigners. And Zia never re uh, retorted. But he kept all this in his mind. He thought, ki, Ek din ah, let, the, let the time come, I will show him. Okay. So, uh, and there were other ways of why he would, uh, so he was uh, commanding uh, in Multan. The field firing took place. So he, Bhutto came to on a visit and he aimed the gun at a particular target and asked Bhutto, but he had spread that whole area with kerosene and petrol. So that as soon as the shell came anywhere near, the whole thing would blow up and Bhutto would feel good about himself. Bhutto really thought that this man is very submissive. This is army chief. Where will he go? He will be. But when he became chief, and there was this big 
PNA agitation, Pakistan National Alliance agitation, because Bhutto had rigged the 77 elections very badly. He didn't need to, but he really rigged them. So this protest demonstration started against him. Bhutto was turning into a dictator. Yeah, he was very authoritarian man, very, very authoritarian. And this is a reflection of his own character or was it a response to what's happening in India? No, no, his own character. Okay, all right. You see, one of the, uh, he's a very complex man, Bhutto. And one of the reasons for this was that his father, his mother was a Hindu. You know, uh, Shah Nawaz, his father, had married a Hindu dancing girl from Rajasthan, Lucky Bhai. And later on, she converted to Islam and became Khurshid. But Bhutto always carried this complex. And therefore, he had to be much more aggressive. And uh, his mother was not treated well by Shah Nawaz. Shah Nawaz was an aristocrat, he was a huge landlord. His family did not treat Lucky Bai well, and Bhutto saw this. And then he too did not treat his mother well. So she actually cursed him. She told another politician, Sumro, his wife, that this, you know, he's troubled me so much that he will come to a sticky end. <laughs> That's all documented. I, again, I mentioned in my book. This is some film level shit. <laughs> but anyway, go on. So there was one politician, and he was very arrogant. He would brutal with people who opposed him. Or, except for one politician, Jam Sadiq Ali, who was the um, Sindhi politician. It's a very interesting uh, narrative. Uh, so one day, Bhutto was sitting and Jam Sadiq Ali walked past him. So Bhutto said, no salam. You know, because he didn't wish him a salam or that. He said, you know, your father we should sit on the floor in my father's kacheri. So Jam Sadiq Ali was not a guy to take it lying down. So he turned around and said, yes, because that was the best seat in the house to see Lucky Bai dance. Oh. Bhutto was shocked. That's the only time he didn't react. He couldn't react. He didn't know what to do. And let Jam Sadiq live. Any other people who sort of rubbed him the wrong way, be brutal, brutal with him. So because of his arrogance, he rigged this election. Then the Pakistan National Alliance, they got together. Massive agitation took place. And agitation took place in Lahore. And there when the army, Bhutto requested for the army's help. And there when the army was asked to fire on this crowd, three brigadiers refused to fire. And that's when Zia, I think, realized that the integrity of the army is going to be. If people start not firing or not obeying orders, then something needs to be done. I think that's when he acted and he arrested Bhutto and uh, things like that. Speak about, expand this moment, this chapter. Yeah, so uh, so he got the whole cabinet arrested. Okay. So when the coup was going to be carried out, his um, one of his chief of staff, again, I forget his name, and he was going to arrest various uh, politicians. And Zia was still nervous because, you know, he said, Murshid Marwa Badena. You know, don't get me killed because of this coup. So in any case, the coup happened. All these people were arrested. And again, there was a time when he said he would leave Bhutto and Bhutto could come into politics. But Bhutto was not willing to compromise. He said, I'm going to fix Zia. So one politician, crafty politicians told Zia, Ek cover hai aur do hai. If you don't put Bhutto in, you are going in. I think that's when Zia got the hint that, you know, Bhutto has to be hanged, otherwise he it'll be his turn. He'll go for the gallows. What panned out? Zia hung the Bhutto. It was judicially, uh, you know, proved. So there was an old case uh, which was revived. One of the pol politicians had been uh, shot at and uh, the real target missed and the guy's father was killed. And um, so that was resuscitated, you know, it was pulled up. And uh, the judgment was that uh, Bhutto was responsible and he was hanged. Why would someone want to willingly become a politician in Pakistan? <laughs> 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 Seriously. Like even this whole Imran Khan thing, you hear about how he's shot in the leg and all that. How this... You know, um, Shehbaz Sharif, who just demitted office, is probably the only prime minister who had a farewell when he left office. All other prime ministers have either been Hung, arrested or booted out. He got a farewell. Why? So to answer your question, why would a politician want to, want to be a person want to be a politician in Pakistan? 
because they can do what they want. The army keeps tabs on them. They feel that if they have good relationship with the army, they can survive. Businesses, look at the way the businesses, people who have got into politics, the way the businesses, the kind of money they have made and influence they have got is because of uh, you know, very little of accountability. So it comes from a place of lusting for power and money uh, at the cost of you kind of being submissive towards the army. As in that's the cost, that's the price you pay. That's the price you pay, except Imran Khan did not want to pay the price. He thought he was larger than the army. He thought he was larger than the state. You know, the kind of cult figure that he developed and the way the people brought him up, he is some kind of a demigod, all through social media. Okay. He yeah. felt, you know. No, this is a whole other topic, which we'll, we'll come to. I think we've reached the late 70s on this story at yeah. this point. Uh, so then Zia carried on for over a decade. Okay. Till 1988, 11 years. Is this where the Pakistani military consolidated its power as the main leadership in Pakistan? It had been done during Ayub's time also. Okay. Uh, Yahya Khan got dissipated because of the creation of Bangladesh. But the biggest legacy of Zia is the Islamization of Pakistan. He was a real believer that this is an Islamic state. People must be Islamized. So he Islamized education. He introduced the Tablighi Jamaat into cantonments. People started growing, army officers started growing beards started doing the namaz and you know, the Islamization, the consequences of which Pakistan is facing today is during Zia's Islamization. That was his biggest uh, sort of uh, contribution. Okay. And then the nuclear program sort of uh, carried out, you know, continued, he's persisted with it despite the US. You see, he was a pariah after he hung Bhutto. But then the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan in 1979. December 79. And then the US needed Pakistan. And Pakistan was willing. So all Zia's sins were forgotten. <laughs> okay. Very much happened to say anything happened to Musharraf too. Hmm. Once that was done, and then, you know, the, the Soviet Union sort of long 10 years uh, fighting in uh, Afghanistan. Then uh, 1988, uh, Zia died in the plane crash. A, and, a plane crash? Yeah, Bahulpur. Yeah. You mean like in inverted commas? Yes, nobody knows how it died. Okay. So whether it was a bomb, whether it was gas, or what happened, uh, along with the US ambassador. And nice. three or four other generals. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, conspiracy theory yeah. domain. Yeah, and, and still no answer till today. So possibly they were killed by either the US or Russia. That's what I'm assuming the next. No, it could be Shias. Some Shia, Shia conspiracy <laughs> because see, he introduced a system of zakat, which was as per the Sunni rights, as per the Sunni belief. And there was this big rivalry between Iran and Saudi Arabia and the battlefield was Pakistan. Persecution of Shias. Okay. So people suspect it could have been a Shia, especially from uh, Gilgit. There's no solid answer. But then why would the American uh, ambassador be targeted as well? Just what is the best foolproof thing that if you want to kill somebody, kill it along with the US ambassador? Ah. There are no suspicions. Okay. Which year was this? Late 80s. In 1988. Too much is happening in the world in the 70s and the 80s. Okay. Uh, the Cold War is an angle here as well. And the killing? In the 80s. Yeah, because this, then the Soviets had to withdraw. They withdrew in 89. February 89, the last uh, Soviet soldier crossed the bridge in Haritan. Right. And walked across. Okay. It was a very orderly exit. Only one person was killed among the Soviet army. And the Soviet army withdrew. Unlike when the uh, Americans withdrew from Kabul. You know, recently we saw that all on television. Right. Soviet exit was very orderly. Okay. As a result of the Geneva Accords and, you know, so mm -hmm. they withdrew. And at this time, POK, Pakistan Occupied Kashmir, is being used as a same base camp for taking over Kashmir. Yeah, eventually. and all the... Uh, uh, modules which are infiltrating into India through uh, camps in POK. Okay. Uh, I had some IPS officers on the show who had served in Kashmir, including uh, Shahida Ma'am, who's grown up in Kashmir. She says that the Kashmir of the 70s and 80s was actually nice. So what was happening in those camps? If they were infiltrating, they were trying to cause a ruckus in the Kashmir at that time. Yeah. You see, again, this whole thing in uh, Kashmir started off because... In 1986, the elections were rigged. You know, um, 
in the Indian part, the elections were rigged. There was a lot of protest movement and things started off then. And then Pakistan opened the floodgates and a lot of people from Kashmir went to Pakistan for training. And they came back trained. And they started with JKLF, uh, Jammu and Kashmir Liberation Front, was the first uh, sort of organization. But they wanted independence. And that was not, Pakistan was not comfortable with any independence of Kashmir. Mm -hmm. So then they set up the Hezbollah Mujahideen, which wanted merger of Jammu and Kashmir with Pakistan. Okay. And then all other organizations that were set up were all merger for Pakistan and JKLS was gradually marginalized. And the collateral damage was the uh, Kashmiri Pandit exodus in all this. Again, the geopolitical... And the, the normal uh, Muslim Kashmiri too, so many of their families died. I mean, they were the victims. Uh, victims in the sense, they brought the brunt. Hmm. Okay. <sighs> this is what happens when you use religion as a tool to control yeah. the masses. Yeah. That now people, now if you see the memes and videos coming out of Kashmir, uh, people are saying we were made fools of by Pakistan for two generations. They've lost two generations. Mm. With a lot of time they've lost. You know, that we were totally misled. Coming back to Pakistan, so this is a never-ending tangential yeah, absolutely. discussion. Absolutely. Uh, so that's when the then the terrorist, terrorism started in Kashmir. And now, you know, because of the Indian Army's efforts, the security grid is so strong. But it took a long time. It took a huge toll of people. It took a toll of Indian, you know, the developmental activities in Kashmir. And now you find the fruits, the results, and the kind of happiness in Kashmir. What happened between the early 90s and Kargil? All this was happening. But why did Kargil end up happening from the Pakistani perspective? Yeah. So, you know, in the 90s, there was this cat and mouse game between Benazir and Nawaz Sharif. Two years, Benazir, then she was dismissed. Then Nawaz Sharif came into power. He Two years, he was dismissed. Benazir came back into power. Till finally, in 1999, Musharraf staged a coup. And became you know, the dictator, the chief martial law administrator and things like that. As a brigadier, Musharraf had given a briefing to Benazir about Kargil. That this is what we can do. And Benazir shot it down saying this will lead to a war with India. Forget it. But when he was chief himself, so there were four people. There was chief of general staff, there was um, corps commander Rawal Pindi and the force commander in other areas. A chap called Javed Hassan. Again, digressing a bit, when Javed Hassan was the uh, in the NDC, National uh, Staff, uh, Staff College Quetta, he carried out a study called India, a study in profile. After studying 2000 years of Indian history, he made certain conclusions. And among the key conclusion was that the Hindu has no stomach for a fight. Right? And this is what Musharraf also believed in. So they believed when they launched something like Kargil, the Indian reaction would be so poor and weak that they will not be able to dislodge them from Kargil. And the Kashmir issue will get a huge boost and they would have got a chunk of territory and they will take revenge of Siachen. And then gradually be able to expand. Now, Nawaz, uh, Nawaz Sharif says that he wasn't consulted. This was Musharraf on his own. There was a controversy. Both sides of the story are there. But the fact was that when they, the reaction of Indian army was so severe and so savage that Musharraf and the Pakistan army was stunned. When Nawaz Sharif asked Musharraf that what is happening, you told me uh, there are these Kashmiris fighting over there and now you say there are uh, Pakistan army. He said we didn't expect that the Indian army would react so strongly. Are right? You starting something, uh, you know, and then you think the Indian army will not react so strongly. Overconfidence. Overconfidence. And though Musharraf claims that Nawaz Sharif sold him out by visiting Clinton, I demonstrate in my book that even before Nawaz Sharif went to the US, Nawaz Sharif and Musharraf had agreed with the US visiting general. The general said, you can visit Clinton only if you agree to withdraw from Kargil and you maintain the sanctity of the line of control. And what was in it for the US? They didn't want, uh, you know, both countries had recently become nuclear, turned nuclear. They didn't want this kind of a fight to go on. So that is the first time that the US did not support Pakistan. You know, and for India, that is a huge signal. Knowing the US, my follow-up question is why? Because they realized that Pakistan was totally on the wrong. They couldn't defend. They could not accept the, viola the sanctity of the LOC being violated. So okay. when... Um, uh, this general who visited and he written about it. And Musharraf was on board. They agreed that they will start pulling back. 
And before Musharraf, uh, before Nawaz Sharif went to Washington, they could, the US satellites picked up, uh, Pakistan is moving out. And um, uh, Clinton told Musharraf, Musharraf uh, Nawaz Sharif the same thing, that the sanctity of the LOC has to be maintained. So Nawaz Sharif actually bailed out Musharraf, rather than the other way around, rather Musharraf accusing him. But Nawaz Sharif, he could have sacked Musharraf at that time and regained control of the Pakistan army. But he delayed it too long. I wish time Musharraf had gone through all the contournments and built up support for himself. So that when finally Nawaz Sharif sacked Musharraf in that famous flight from Colombo, which was coming back, uh, it was too late. You'll have to give some last bit of context here before I let you go, sir. So he, was come, he had gone on a trip to uh, Colombo for, on a visit. And when he was coming back, Orders were issued by Nawaz Sharif to divert the flight from Karachi and take it to a small airport in Jakubabad or some other place. And then the pilot came to Musharraf, who was sitting in front, that, you know, we were not being allowed to land in Karachi. Should we land in Bombay because we are running short of fuel? So Musharraf said, over my dead body. He didn't want to land, you know, so much of hatred uh, he had for India. So then his core commander in Karachi and his chief of general staff they took control of Karachi airport. And when they made the plane land, and to, even though Nawaz Sharif appointed a new army chief, who was the ISI chief, Ziauddin, you see, the ISI is a security agency, but doesn't have troops. The troops were with the Triple One Brigade, the famous Triple One Brigade, Rawal Pindi, or the core commander, Rawal Pindi. Ziauddin had no troops to enforce the fact that he had become army chief. So then when Musharraf landed, Orders were given and Nawaz Sharif was arrested. That, you know, famous picture of soldiers climbing the gates of the Pakistan television. And, you know, thereafter is history. Then Nawaz Sharif was sent off on exile and uh, things like that. As I said in the last podcast, sir, cluster f- <laughs> It's just, this is, this is what this history seems like at this point. Yeah. I'm sorry, like, to all the Pakistani listeners. I do not mean to offend you. But this is the first time I'm learning about Pakistani history in so much detail. And... Now you know why I write on Pakistan. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's like a real life. Drama. I was going to say, have you ever watched wrestling, WWE? Yeah. It's always things happening. That's what it seems like yeah. here. Someone's against the other. Some drama is happening. Some wrong decision after the other. Which has led to what we see today. Yeah. yeah. So now I'm assuming that you've been an observer for decades. You could have predicted that this is going to happen. No, Pakistan crisis. still has an element of unpredictability because, you know, <laughs> you, you, as a rational thinker, you would say, this is the way to go. But irrationality in Pakistan is... Do you watch cricket? Yeah. You know that that's what they say about the Pakistani cricket team also. You never know what you're going to get. You'll either Unpredictable. Get world champs or you'll get out in the group stages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Full stop. <laughs> because this is too dense a podcast to continue. Yeah. We've not covered all of Pakistani history. Uh, so next time we can do Musharraf onwards. Yes, Musharraf yes. and onwards. Yes. Please return to the show soon, sir. I'm going to try making it happen next week when I'm in Delhi. Okay. Tilak, sir, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for teaching me. I'm sorry I couldn't do justice to these conversations. That's what I feel often after meeting people like yourself, where I feel like I've just scratched the surface. It's the tip of the iceberg in terms of... No, I think we've covered a huge ground and uh, intense... Uh, discussion on several topics and uh, you don't have to feel that you haven't covered enough ground. I think there's a lot. When you watch it again, you'll find there is a lot of ground that has been covered. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Before I let you go, probably just give me a conclusive sentence or a paragraph on this entire story that you've relayed. So, you today. know, the, in my first book, I mentioned one sentence and I think about it a lot and I keep repeating it on uh, whenever I giving lectures in defense establishments. I mentioned, I asked a question in my book. Is Pakistan ungovernable or are its leaders incapable of governing Pakistan? Now, that sums up the Pakistani experience from 47 till today. Is Pakistan ungovernable or the leaders incapable of governing Pakistan? 
I'll give you the answer in the next episode. <laughs> Cliffhanger. Okay. All I have to say is thank you. And uh, Virat Kohli greater than Babar Azam. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry, guys. But thank you, sir. I thank you very much. It. Thank you for inviting me here. I really enjoyed the conversation. And time seems to have flown. We've been talking for what, two and a half hours. Yeah. But wow. It's been a crazy interaction. The world of podcast needs you more. So <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. That was the episode for today. I have nothing to say in the outro other than the fact that this particular conversation deserves a sequel. Tilaksa is going to be back on the show, but I'd like to know from both the Indians and Pakistanis watching this, what other kind of topics would you want from a geopolitical perspective, from an India-Pakistan perspective? Do you guys have Pakistani guest recommendations? I'm very open to doing a Dubai shoot schedule and hosting some of my Pakistani friends on the show. Uh, I want to bring you guys the truth and not really a biased perspective, even from a geopolitics standpoint. So please tell me what you thought of this particular conversation. The RS is only going to get better through your feedback. Keep supporting. There's a long way to go. There's a lot of knowledge to be accumulated. We are only just getting started. Thank you for all the love. Thank you.